Hello, citizens of Earth, and welcome to this week's edition of Tomorrow News. Ryan is going to be talking about some stars. I'm going to be talking about some stars jumping, and we've got Dr. Tamitha Scope to talk about the weather that our own star is making as well. Before we get into it, just want to remind you that if you like what we're doing here tomorrow, don't forget to subscribe to us, like our videos, set up notifications, and share our videos everywhere that you can. So let's go ahead and just jump right into it. This is your Tomorrow News for June 23rd, 2020. And Ryan, what's up, homie? One of SN7's tanks was being tested the other day, but it didn't end perfectly. The tank reached 7.6 bar, which is a big achievement. However, at the end of the test, there was a small leak in the tank. The high amount of gas visible afterwards is most likely the SpaceX team trying to quickly depressurize to minimize the damage done. Any repairs that have needed doing to SN7 have also been done as work on a super heavy launch pad has been underway. The older two members of the Starship family have also been found to be hanging out together literally when they were being moved by the crane in the highway down in the south of Texas. But it isn't just Starship being looked at down there though, as several antennas have been spotted on top of a building which perfectly fit the description of the Starlink terminals. 100 satellites have been planned for launch with SpaceX's rideshare program, which had its first launch on the previous Starlink mission. Two more are going to be launched on the next Starlink mission, being two Earth imaging satellites from Black Sky, which should be launching around 2158 UTC this Tuesday, the 23rd of June. The rideshare program is putting a serious spanner in the works for purely small sat launch providers such as Rocket Lab and the up and coming Virgin Orbit, who both have been putting in serious efforts into their respective vehicles, with Virgin Orbit testing Launcher 1 and Rocket Lab testing their capabilities to recover an Electron first stage booster. If none of the small sat launch providers do something to promote their services, then it is starting to look like SpaceX will have a hold on the market, which is kind of what the entire commercialization of rocket launches has been about. Who can provide the best technology and the best efficiency for the cheapest cost? Reusing rockets has been clearly shown that in order to save cost, you must reuse. So maybe Rocket Lab reusing the Electron rocket could save them a few more customers instead of them using SpaceX. Ryan talked about stars, and they have had a pretty big part of human history. I mean, we took inspiration from looking up at them at night. We made patterns out of what we could see on the sky. We made stories for those patterns. Heck, we even used stars to navigate across the land and the oceans here on Earth. And we still use stars today to navigate that final frontier, the silent sea of space. And we've done so exclusively using objects within our own solar system. But the New Horizons spacecraft is so far away right now that it's been able to test a potential piece of interstellar navigation. New Horizons is the spacecraft that revealed the planet Pluto in glorious detail to us in 2015 and then wowed us with a peek into our own origins flying past cold Kuiper Belt object Arakoth in 2019. And in April, an experiment of epic proportions was attempted, interstellar parallax. Now, you may be wondering what parallax is, and you're in luck. We can actually do an experiment together in order to show what parallax is. So, what I want you to do, go ahead and back up a little bit and make a fist. Make sure not to hit your computer or anybody around you. Now, take a finger and put it up. No, not that finger. Choose a different finger. And then what I want you to do is put this finger about 20 centimeters away from your face. Now, close one eye, keep the other open. And then close your open eye and open the closed one. Now go back and forth really, really fast between your two eyes. And your finger, of course, isn't moving, but that apparent motion, that's called parallax. You can measure parallax of a handful of the closest stars with the most potent telescopes on Earth by taking images of their relative positions in the sky six months apart when you're on the opposite side of the Earth's orbit around the Sun. But New Horizons is a mind-blowing 7 billion kilometers away. It changed its attitude to look at two nearby stars, Wolf 359, which is only 7.9 light years away from us, and our closest stellar neighbor, Proxima Centauri, a hop, skip, and a jump of 4.2 light years. 
That imagery shows a Proxima Centauri hopping about. Comparing the relative position of Proxima Centauri in the sky compared to Earth allows you to build a triangle between Proxima Centauri, the New Horizons spacecraft, and Earth. And you know the distance of New Horizons from Earth, and you also know the distance of Earth and Proxima Centauri, and you also know the angle of where the Earth sits in that triangle between New Horizons and Proxima Centauri. And if you know a little trigonometry, you actually have enough information to find New Horizons distance to Proxima Centauri in our epic unknown side angle side triangle, which will give AP mathematics students nightmares for the rest of their lives. If you can solve that unknown side and the two unknown angles of that triangle, let us know in the comments below. And if you get it right, which, by the way, I've done the math to figure out what it is. If you get it right, we will feature it here on our next news episode in order to show everybody just how much of a huge dork you are. Now, in order to talk a little bit more about some dorkish mathematics that actually did some pretty potent stuff this week, we're going to go ahead and jump right into our space traffic. We begin again this week in China, where at 0719 Universal Time on June 17th, a Long March 2D commenced an uphill from the Zhiquan Space Center carrying Gaofen 903. This is a remote sensing satellite that carries an optical sensor capable of one meter resolution. Now, it's unknown if the three Gaofen 9 satellites are of identical design or if each is custom designed for a specific one meter resolution remote sensing capability. Our only other launch of the week also comes from China. At the Zhisheng Space Center, a Long March 3B lifted off on June 23rd at 0143 Universal, carrying the final Beidou 3 satellite for China's indigenous navigation system. In a very unusual move from China, this launch was highly publicized and included a live stream of the launch, including views of additional stages beyond the first and a view of the Beidou 3 satellite being released from its upper stage and unfurling its solar panels. China's Beidou navigation system has 44 operational satellites and unlike GPS from the United States or GLONASS from Russia which are in medium Earth orbit, the Beidou constellation includes several satellites in geosynchronous orbit. And here are your upcoming launches. Gather round everyone, it's time for another Jared's Yeehaw Get On Launch Little Doggies Spaceflight Bonanza. Virgin Galactic and NASA have signed a Space Act agreement that may see a training program for private astronauts formed. SpaceX is working with Axiom Space and Boeing with Space Adventures to begin to carry private astronauts to the International Space Station, and not just as tourists, but scientists and others as well. Virgin Galactic's services would be used to prepare astronauts for what to expect, such as experiencing the forces of launch and moving around in a microgravity environment. Uh, consider it like a souped up vomit comet. Now, this comes hot on the heels of NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine letting it be known that the agency was beginning to seriously consider certifying commercial crewed suborbital vehicles and an announcement only just a few days ago that a request for information and that's usually the first step in a program's development to certify these vehicles is going to be put out in the next week. And it's not just NASA making commercial market moves. The U.S. Department of Defense has awarded six contracts to small satellite launch vehicle companies using funds from the Defense Production Act via the Coronavirus Aid and Economic Security Act. Avium, Astra, Expo, Rocket Lab, Space Vector, and Vox Space were all given non-competitive contracts for two dedicated rideshare missions with DOD payloads. And keep your eyes peeled open for Astra, they're likely going to be attempting their rocket, which is named one of three, sometime in the next month. Boy, and Rocket Lab is really on a roll. They may be under pressure from SpaceX, but they have snagged two more contracts from the United States National Reconnaissance Office for two more launches of NRO payloads next year. Now, the NRO has been using its rapid acquisition of a small rocket contract to grab Rocket Lab payload slots, and the partnership is definitely working out for both. And now for this week's look at the sun with space weather, here is Dr. Tamitha Scove. 
After multiple solar storm launches over the past few days, our sun finally begins to settle down just a little bit. Now, as we switch to our front side sun, you can see region 2765 as it's rotating off of the sun's west limb. And now we are back to a spotless sun. We do have a, a kind of a remnant coronal hole here in the middle of the sun. You can see it looks more like potholes. And what that means is that we're not going to really get any fast wind from this, just more like unsettled wind, kind of disturbed conditions. And that may not even be able to bring us aurora even down to high latitudes because it's just not going to be enough fast pockets of wind to, to cause any ruckus. Now past that we also have a small filament in the northwestern part of the sun. This region was actually one of the regions that launched a solar storm when it was on the sun's far side and it looks like that filament channel is beginning to fill up again. You can kind of see a dark filament there but it's not enough to erupt. I think it's we're not going to worry about getting another solar storm launch from it because it looks pretty stable. Now as we switch to our far-sided sun, this is stereo A and it's looking at the sun pretty much from the side. You can see those two bright regions, the first of which has already rotated into Earth view and the second one will rotate into Earth view here over the next couple days. Both of these regions will keep that solar flux boosted so radio propagation should stay in the marginal range on Earth's day side probably over the next week. However, neither of these regions are flare active, so GPS users you should be very happy we don't have any risk for radio black blackouts. On top of that, you can see these are both high latitude regions, which means they are activity from the new solar cycle. So this is more evidence that our sun is continuing to wake up. And if you happen to miss that ring of fire solar eclipse, no worries. That's not the only eye candy gracing the skies this week. We actually have a lot going on when it comes to sun diving comets. In fact, we have the 4,000th comet that was discovered in SOHO's data. Yes, you heard me, 4,000th comet. You can see it right here. And it was followed by the 3,999th comet that made a gorgeous display as it had its close flyby of the sun there. It was seen both in the SOHO view, which is Earth view, but also in Stereo's view. You can see it in the chronograph there as well. And if you miss those, no worries, because next week we have Neowise. This comet should be entering the coronagraph fields of view of both SOHO and Stereo, and it's going to make its closest approach to the sun on July 3rd, so there's a lots of time yet to watch. For more details on this week's space weather, including that ring of fire solar eclipse and those sun diving comets, come check out my channel or see me at spaceweatherwoman.com. And to wrap up this week's Tomorrow News, I just want to thank all of you who helped contribute to the shows of tomorrow. We really can't do this without you, and each and every one of you who helps us out, you are absolutely amazing, and it is greatly appreciated. Here, have an Air 5 right at the screen right now. Now, if you would like to contribute to the shows of tomorrow, head on over to youtube.com slash tmro slash join to do so, and check out all the great rewards that we have available for you at the different levels of support. You should also check out our Discord server as well. Had a really spirited discussion uh, today about whether hot dogs were sandwiches or not, and as far as I'm concerned, they are, but I believe in radical sandwich anarchy. And of course, watching our shows, liking, subscribing, setting up notifications, and sharing us everywhere that you can is an incredible help as well. And because I missed putting our ground support folks in last week's show, here you go, a little extra time for you this week. Now get real close to the screen and get a good look at where your name is. And don't forget to bust out your Sharpie and circle around it so that way you'll know where it is when you're rewatching this episode of Tomorrow News. And that's Seco for this edition of Tomorrow News. Thank you so much for watching us. And until the next one, remember, stay safe, stay healthy, and keep exploring. Thank you so much for watching us. And until the next one, remember, stay safe, stay felt, which has their satellites in medium Earth orbit. This. <clears throat>